Hello folks and thanks for joining me. This will be the 23rd reading book on this channel after the uh, long, long delay. I thought I would get back to some of these finally as I've been wanting to. And uh, as you can see, get to, you know, um, just haven't had time this last year, and so, been a lot going on, um, I have posted up, started posting up Zeph's here, you know, a couple of years ago on this channel, because of, because of the channel that got, uh, the time taken away, and, uh, so that's why we, we have kind of a, a mix of material on this channel more than I had originally planned on. Um, to, for today's reading and to get back into the, the swing of these readings, I want to start off with a older, uh, oh, have a philosophy of what Freemasonry originally was and is supposed to be. And to a lot of people it is, uh, in the lower ranks. in the Blue Lodge and, and <clears throat> the, they're inculcated with certain values certain ideas and just like people that are in the church that are stuck in the churches uh, not realizing that the rituals and stuff that they do uh, have you know um, compromised their position and this uh, is, a, as it's, as you can see, it says a lecture on the various rituals of Freemasonry from the 10th century, and this is a lecture from a time that was before the 20th century uh, corruption and occultation of uh, Freemasonry as we know it today, which was mainly perpetrated by the likes of Albert Pikes and and the Manly P. Halls, and the, when they uh, started mixing heavily in their in their literature and stuff, the uh, Mystery Babylon uh, type religion into Freemasonry. When you know originally and way back in the day, Freemasonry was not about Mystery Babylon. They were not intermixed. Now there may have been Freemasons that that you know were into the back then we called pagan religions and stuff but that doesn't you know it wasn't connected as a whole uh, evil satanic thing quote unquote until the 20th century and by the infiltrators of and so we're going to go back to a little time this is uh, delivered in the Witham Lodge in Lincoln 1863 by the Reverend G. Oliver D.D. Past DPGM Grant, that's you know Deputy Grandmaster or something like that for Lincolnshire. Okay, uh, he was Grandmaster, honorary member of numerous lodges and literary societies in various parts of the world. And he starts off. He says, "Brethren, it is rather late in life for me to appear before a lodge of intelligent masons in the capacity of a lecturer, and it is only the respect I entertain for masonry that could induce me to do so." and even under the influence of that feeling I should scarcely have ventured to solicit your attendance this evening if I had not been under an impression that I could tell you something which is not generally known to the fraternity indeed I am satisfied from the general tenor of my Masonic correspondence that there are many brethren in England who would travel over half the island and think themselves well paid for their trouble to acquire the information I am now about to communicate to you not only on the ancient rituals but on various signs tokens and observances used by the fraternity many years ago and now entirely forgotten during the last century, several revisions of the ritual took place, each being an improvement on its predecessor, and all based on the primitive Masonic lecture, which was drawn up in the 10th century, and attached to the York Constitutions. This lecture, to which I shall first call your attention, 
was in doggerel rhyme, a kind of composition which was very popular amongst our Saxon ancestors in the time of Athelstane. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> about the latter end of the 14th century. It was carefully translated from the Saxon for the use of the York Grand Lodge and the, and the MS of that date is now in the British Museum. This invaluable document contains copious rules and regulations for observance of the craft and is so curious that I shall give you a specimen of it to show the unchangeable character of the order. It thus describes the duty of the master, and see the the brother the brotherhood has uh, uh, that was one you know original rule of Freemasonry uh, not to be modified not to be changed, and thus uh, we see what has happened to it today. The unchangeable character of the order has in fact been changed since since this time here that we're reading now. The first article of good masonry shows that the master must surely be both steadfast, trusty, and also true. His place he never then shall rue. He must neither nor for love nor dread of neither party to take mead, whether he lord or fellow be, of him to take kind of fee, no kind of fee, sorry, and but as a judge to stand upright, and then his con conduct will be bright. Uh, so no, take no bribe, take no fees. Uh, <laughs> it speaks thus of an EAP, the master shall not for any vantage make an apprentice under age, and, as you may plainly hear, he must have his limbs both whole and fair. For to the craft it were great shame to make half a man and a lame, make a half man and a lame, for a man of tainted blood would do the craft but little good. So, and you know, in essence, they don't take cripples or people with mental handicaps or physical handicaps, etc. They want whole, well-bodied men for the craft. And uh, notice the mention of tainted blood, saying that such things. Uh, is also bloodline related. This was a primitive observance amongst the craft, for in the constitutions of Athelstane, the EAP was solemnly enjoyed. His master's counsel to keep close, lest he confidence should lose. The uh, secrets of brethren tell no one, nor out of the lodge, what there is done. Whatever you hear the master say, be sure thou never do betray. Okay, secrecy, secrecy, secrecy. Lest it cause in thee much blame and bring the craft to public shame. So, in secrecy, they do these things, okay, that they do. Why would it bring the craft to shame? What are they doing in secret that they... Sh automatically I have admitted to themselves as shameful. Isn't that interesting? Here also we find the origin of a clause in our present master's obligation. It charges thee upon thy life not to corrupt thy master's wife, nor thy fellow's concubine, as thou wouldst not have him do thine by thine. Full mickle care might thus begin from such a foul and deadly sin. The obligation was thus constructed, the fourteenth point is full good law, to him that would be under awe. A solemn oath he needs must swear, to his master and fellows hat be there. To be both steadfast and true also, to all these laws wherever he go, and to his liege lord the king, to be true above all other things. So, honor, trueness, don't betray your brethren, don't be screwing his wife. Don't be causing strife. You take the oath to your fellow brethren. Thus did our ancient brethren lecture 800 years ago, establishing a series of landmarks which are not yet overthrown. In the reign of Edward III, A.D. 1357, the decrees of the order ran in the following form. That for the future, at the making or admission of a brother, the ancient constitutions and charges shall be read. 
that when the master and wardens preside in a lodge, the sheriff, if need be, or the mayor, or the alderman, if a brother were where the chapter is held, shall be associate to the master, that the fellow craft shall travel honestly for their pay, and love their fellows as themselves, and that all shall be true to the king, to the realm, to the lodge, that if any of the fraternity should be fractious, mutinous, or disobedient to the master's orders, and after proper admission should re persist in his rebellion, he shall forfeit all claims to the rights, benefits, and privileges of a true and faithful brother. These charges conclude with the words, So mote it be. The first catechismal catechismal uh, catechism, no, catechismal formula was introduced by the Grand Master Sir Christopher Wren about the year 1685 and was called an examination. It was very concise and it might be gone through in ten minutes or a quarter of an hour. The obligation uh, was short and simple. Um, it had no penalty, and for that which is now used as a penalty formed a portion of the examination. Um, as thus, which is the point of your entry? Hear and conceal under the penalty of having my throat cut or my tongue pulled out of my head, end quote. I am inclined to think that Freemasonry at this time had only one degree. <laughs> You would probably like to hear a few passages from Sir Christ Christopher's ritual. It commenced as thus. And, uh... <laughs> Hold on a second. That is small interruption. Sorry about that. So, the, uh, ceremony ritual went as thus, and the question would be, Peace be to all here. And answer, I hope there will. What o'clock is it? It's going to six or going to twelve. Are you very busy? No. Will you give or take? Both, or which you please. How go squares? Straight. Are you rich or poor? Neither. Change me that. And then the signs given. I will. What is a mason? A man begot by a man, born of a woman, brother to a king, fellow to a prince. In the name of the king and holy church are you a mason. I am so received and accepted. Where were you made a mason? In a just and perfect lodge. And how many make a lodge? A god and the square with five or seven right and perfect masons on the highest mountains or the lowest valleys in the world. Where is the master's point? At the east window, waiting, the rising of the sun, to set his men to work. How is the meridian found out? When the sun leaves the south and breaks in the west, end of the lodge. This will be sufficient to show you in what manner the brethren worked 180 years ago. The craft at that time had a series of signs to make themselves known to each other as masons, which are now obsolete, and I introduce them here as a matter of curiosity. When meeting in the street, they saluted each other by raising their hat with the thumb and two fingers only. Sometimes they would strike the inside of the little finger on, of the left hand three times with the forefinger of the right or rub their right eye three times with two fingers, or they would take up a stone and ask what it smells of, and the correct answer to which was neither a brass, iron, nor any other metal but of a mason. What is your name? E.A.P. Lewis or Caution. F.C. Geometry or Square. And the master, and these are actually labels. These are people. These are the the titles of the individuals that are speaking. Is which are like like the master mason, casa or caban. Question: How old are you? And the AP replies: Under seven years. The master mason says: Above uh, seven years. And the EAP is a, something apprentice or prospect or something like that. I think. Anyway, I'm, I'd have to verify that. Don't 
hold me on that one. Anyway, when in a mixed company, the token was to turn down their glass after drinking. And if anyone saw a brother misconduct himself, he exhibited his disgust by placing his open right hand on his upper lip, which served as a check to further indiscretion. Uh, the operative fraternity in these ages had a certain private had certain private signals which must have been very convenient. For instance, if a master wanted one of his workmen from the top of a steeple, he would catch his eye and then touch the calf of his right leg. If from any other part of the church, the left ankle. If from any secular edifice, he put his right hand behind his back. If he wanted a man at the house of a rendezvous, he put his left hand behind. There were many others of similar nature, which are now obsolete. As masonry increased in popularity under the patronage of noble and influential grand masters during the 18th century, many improvements were made on the primitive ritual at different periods. The Reformation was commenced by brothers de Sigulers and Anderson about a year, oh, about the year 1720, and their ritual mentions for the first time a master's part. There was no master's part before 1720. And here also the obligation, or ob obligation, yeah, is accompanied by a penalty, but not by, not a syllable is mentioned about a substituted word. On the contrary, it asserts that the lost word was actually found. I shall give you specimens of this formula in each of the three degrees, merely premising uh, that in those days the office of the deacon was known, unknown. Okay, the inner de, there's your EAD, inner apprentice's degree. Uh, inner uh, apprentice. Where stands, the, okay, the question goes, where stands the senior inner apprentice? Okay, and the answer is in the South. And the question, what is his business? To hear and receive instructions and welcome strange brothers. Where stands the junior? EAP in the north what is his business to keep out all Cowans and eavesdroppers and if a Cowan or a listener is catched how is he to be punished to be placed under the eaves of the house in rainy weather till the water runs in at his shoulders and out at his heels what do you learn by being an operative mason to hew square mold stone lay a level and raise a per perpendicular what do you learn by being a gentleman mason? Secrecy, morality, and good fellowship. Have you seen a master today? I have. How was he clothed? In a yellow jacket and blue pair of breeches. In the fellow crafts degree, it goes how the question goes, how high was the door in the middle chamber? In the middle of the middle chamber, and the answer so high that a colon could not reach a stick to pin, a pin to it into it. And uh, when you came to the middle chamber, what did you see? And the answer is the resemblance of the letter G. What did that G denote? One that's greater than you. Who is greater than I? That I that am a free and accepted mason and master of a lodge, the grand architect and builder of the universe, or he that was taken up to the top of the pinnacle of the holy temple. Master Mason's degree. Okay, the question starts, from whence came you? From the east. Where are you going? To the west. What are you going to do there? To seek for that which was lost and is now found. What is that which was lost and is now found? The Master Mason's word. What is the name of a Master Mason? Cassia is my name. From a just and perfect lodge I came. A Master Mason raised most rare from the diamond ashlar to the square. And the next advisor of the ritual was Martin Clare, the deputy, Grand Master, and he executed his task so much to the satisfaction of the Grand Lodge that his lectures were ordered to be used by all brethren within the limits of its jurisdiction.
In accordance with his command, we find the officers of the Grand Lodge setting an example in the provinces and in the old minute book of the Lodge in Lincoln, dated 1734, of which Sir Cecil Ray, the deputy provincial master, was the master. There are a series of entries through successive Lodge nights to the following effect. And I quote, that two or more sections, as the case might be, of Martin Clare's lectures were read, when the master gave an elegant charge, went through an examination, and the lodge was closed with songs and decent merriment. End quote. The following extract from these lectures may be acceptable. The question is, what is the covering of a Masonic lodge? And a celestial canopy of diverse colors is the answer. How do we hope to arrive at it? By the help of a ladder. What is it called in scripture? Jacob's ladder. How many rounds or staves are in that ladder? Rounds or staves innumerable, each indicating a moral virtue, but three principal ones called faith, hope, and charity. Describe them. Faith in Christ, hope in salvation, and to live in charity with all mankind. Where does the ladder reach to? to the heavens. What does it rest upon? The holy book. Thirty years after the Great Schism, which split society into two divisions, conventionally distinguished as ancient and modern viz. in 1770, Bro Brother Dunkley was commissioned by the Grand Lodge to compile an improved ritual in all three degrees, which he accomplished to the universal satisfaction of the fraternity. For Brother Dunkley, was a very distinguished mason. In his version, the three principal steps of the Masonic ladder were referred to the Christian doctrine of the three states of the soul. First, in his tabernacle of the body, as the illustration of faith, then, after death in paradise, as the fruits of hope, and lastly, when reunited with the body, in glory about the throne of God, as the sacred seat of the universal charity. The original hint at a circle and parallel lines as important symbols of the orders, order has been ascribed to him. Here, the doctrine of the substituted word was formally announced, for the true word had been transformed to the loyal art. Or, I mean, sorry, royal art, and uh, uh, which he introduced into the Grand Lodge as legitimate degree of masonry, the royal arts degree. Um, as a specimen of this lecture, we take the following extract, and the question goes, How do Masons know each other in the day? Answer, by seeing a brother and observing a sign. How in the night? By feeling a token and hearing the word. How blows a Mason's wind? Favorably do we east and west. For what purpose? To cool and refresh the men go at and from their labor. And what, does further, what does it further allude to? to those miraculous winds which first blew east, then west, and proved so essential in working the happy deliverance of the children of Israel from their Egyptian bondage, and also the overthrow of Pharaoh and his host in their attempt to follow. What time is it? <clears throat> high time. Brother J.W., what is to be done at high time? To call the men from labor to refreshment, to see that they keep within hail and come on again in due time, and that the master may have pleasure and profit thereby. I pass over the lectures of Calcott and Hutchinson, because they were not adapted to lodge practice. The ex ex uh, exemplifications of York Masonry were completed by the celebrated bro Brother Preston, who constructed a ritual which contains a satisfactory survey of the system, as it was undoubtedly used by the New York Lodges, uh, the York Lodges in 1777, when the Lodge of Antiquity, of which Brother Preston was a past master, succeeded from the Grand Lodge or the Lon from the London Grand Lodge and avowed an alliance with the Grand Lodge at York. Besides which, Preston was initiated in a York Lodge and therefore became thoroughly master of all the details as practiced by both sections of the fraternity. His ritual was barely carefully uh, constructed. Uh, 
and as might reasonably be anticipated from a brother of his Masonic learning and research, it contained a lucid exemplification of the ceremonies, doctrines, legends, and symbolical machinery of all the three degrees. And it is to be regretted that some of its most valuable uh, illustrations were omitted by Dr. Hemming and his associates when the ritual was reconstructed by the Lodge of Reconciliation in 1814. For instance, the Prestonian lecture gave the following beautiful definition of masonry which is now lost to the craft. Question, what is masonry? Answer, the study of science and the practice of virtue. What is its object? to rectify our conduct by its sublime morality to render us happy in ourselves and useful to society. What is the ground or plan of masonry? Instruction. Why do you consider it to be such? Because men are never too wise to learn. Hat will ri how will arise wise man, sorry, see hat, it's a misprint, messed me up. How will a wise man do to, or what will a wise man do to obtain it? Okay, that's the question that W is missing. He will seek knowledge. What will a wise mason do? He will do more, for he will never rest until he finds it. Where does he expect to find it? In the East. Why does he expect to find it there? Because man was there created in the image of his maker, there also the holy gospel originated. Knowledge and learning were promulgated, and the arts and sciences flourished. I now proceed, without further, further preface, to the categorical examination of the Prestonian ritual, compared with the Union lectures now in use, merely premising that this learned brother divided each degree into sections and subdivided each section into clauses. This arrangement was adopted as a convenient help to memory. According to his, this plan, a portion of the lecture was delivered to each lodge, night and um, to, uh, not always by the master but by certain brethren who undertook the office of sectionists and clause holders which relieved the chair of much labor without being burdensome to the brethren as it would require a very slight application for any one member to become acquainted with a single clause I shall confine myself to the first section of the EAP lecture, which consists of six comprehensive clauses, each of which I will not only repeat but explain. This section, as uh, the lecture expresses it, is suited to all capacities and ought to be known by every person who wishes to rank as a mason. It consists of general heads, which, though they may be short and simple, will be found to carry weight with them. They not only serve as marks of distinction, but communicate useful and interesting knowledge when they are duly investigated. They qualify us to try to examine the rights of others to our privileges while they demonstrate our own claim, and as they induce us to inquire minutely into the other particulars of greater importance, they serve as a proper introduction to subjects which are more amply explained in the following sections. The first clause, consisting of three questions and answers only, thus concisely expressed. The question, Brother, where did you and I first meet? Answer, on the level. Where do we hope to part? On the square. Why so? As Masons, we ought to always to do with all mankind, but more particularly with obligated brethren. This opening clause requires a passing remark because many persons have founded upon it a clause against us to the effect that we are levelers that Freemasonry by abolishing all human distinctions would disorganize society and reduce it to its primitive elements. But it does no such thing. On the contrary, there is no other existing institution in this country where the grands of rank are better defined and more correctly preserved. Uh, for instance, look around the lodge. The uh, worshipful master sits in the east as a governor invested with power, even to despotism, uh, despotism, if he should consider it safe to use it. 
and the wardens in the west and the south are his assistants, not his equals. Each has a particular duty assigned to him, and beyond that he has no right to interfere. Here we, we uh, conduct the strict order and hierarchy of the fraternity. And the next grade are the deacons. And what is their duty? Not surely to rank in equality with the worshipful master and wardens, but to perform the part of the inferiors in office, to carry messages and commands. It is their province to attend on the worshipful master, and to attend wardens in the active duties of the lodge, such as the reception of candidates into different degrees, and the practice of other important rites and ceremonies. This is the business of the deacons, and by its punctual discharge the office becomes a stepping stone to further preferment. For, as it is incumbent on a brother to serve the office of the warden before he can attain the chair of the lodge, so it ought to be incumbent on a warden to have passed through the grade of a deacon, although it is not absolutely required by the constitutions of masonry. Such are the graduations of rank in the Masonic Lodge, and accordingly, the other officers have their respective duties to perform and rank to support, while the floor members are bound to obey implicity, implicitly with commands of the worshipful master. What is there in all this which tends to the destruction in order in society? Surely nothing. How then are we said to meet on the level? Why? Thus, because our occupations are distinguished by the most perfect brotherly love. When the lodge is open, the brethren as brethren, whatever be their diversity of external rank, are equal. And in process, working the lodge, each bears the burden assigned to him by the worshipful master in the pursuit of that common object, the acquisition of useful knowledge. But when the lodge is closed and the jewels put by, we part on the square. Each individual resumes his rank in society, and honor is given to whom honor is due. The second clause runs thus. From whence come you? From the west, whither going? To the east. What induced you to leave the west and go to the east? In search of a master, and of him to gain instruction. Who are you that want instruction? a free and accepted mason. There is something apparently anomalous in this clause, which I shall point out. The Masonic Chiro is said to travel from the west to the east in the search of instruction. Now, another statement in the same section, as we shall soon see, is ser affirms that he comes from the Holy Lodge of St. John, with which Masonic tradition places at Jerusalem, and consequently eastward as regards this country, and therefore would in reality travel from east to west and not from west to east, as is stated. Oh, I'm sorry about that, hitting the mic. Is stated in the clause. And the fact is that this passage refers simply to the candidate at his initiation, advancing from west to east by twelve irregular steps, irregular from the situation he was then in, being entirely ignorant from where he was going, but eluding to twelve regular steps consisting of eight lines and angles, and morally teaching upright lines as well, squared actions. The third clause, question, what kind of man ought a free and accepted mason be? A free man born, and the answer is, a free man born of a free woman, brother to kings and companion to princes. If masons, uh, why free? And uh, that the vicious habits of slavery might not contaminate the true principles on which masonry is founded. A second reason. Because the Masons who were chosen to build King Solomon's temple were declared free and exempted from all imposts, duties, and taxes afterwards, when this temple had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, the goodwill of Cyrus gave them permission to erect a second temple, he having set them at liberty for that purpose. It is from this epoch that we bear the name of free and accepted Masons. Why brother to kings and companion to princes? A king in a lodge is reminded that although a crown may adorn his head and a scepter his hand, the blood in his veins is derived from the common parent of mankind and is no better than that of the meanest subjects. The statesman, 
the senator and the artist are there taught that equally with others they are by nature exposed to infirmity and disease and that an unforeseen misfortune or a disordered frame may impair their faculties and level them with the most ignorant of their species this cheeks pride and incites courtesy of behavior men of inferior talents who are not placed by fortune in such exalted stations are instructed in the lodge to regard their superiors with particular peculiar esteem. When they discover them voluntarily divested of the trappings of external grandeur and condescending in the badge of innocence and bond of friendship to trace wisdom and follow virtue assisted by those who are of rank beneath them. Virtue is true nobility, and wisdom is the channel by which virtue is directed and conveyed. Wisdom and virtue only mark distinction among masons. Whence originated the phrase, born of a free woman. At the grand festival, which was given by Abraham, at the weaning of his son Isaac. Afterwards, when Sarah, the wife of Abraham, beheld Ishmael, and the son of Hagar, the Egyptian bondwoman, teasing and perplexing their son, her son, she remonstrated with Abraham, saying, Put away that bondwoman and her son, for such as they cannot inherit the, the freeborn. She spoke as being endowed with divine inspiration, well knowing that if the lads were brought up together, Isaac may be, might imbibe some of Ishmael's slavish principles in being universally acknowledged that the minds of slaves are much more contaminated than those of the freeborn. Okay? And I, I want to interject here, and you see in the base of all this, and I'm reading here, that the principles, okay, is, is it biblical, it's scriptural, it's historical, Okay, going back to the tribes and Israel and Egypt and the Bible and the whole thing. Okay, this serves as an example. I get a lot of people in the previous readings in the past, and they come on there. And if you talk about uh, Christ or anything that has to do with the Bible and this and that, and they're they're totally uneducated to the true Freemasonry because they're used to the occultic Freemasonry that we have in the 20th century. And that's part of the reason I made this channel to to show the difference. And so the comments and they're like, oh, well, you, you, you know, you don't know what you're talking about because you're talking about biblical stuff and Freemasonry at the same, you know, in the same sentences. Uh, this serves as the perfect example showing that point and that that is not an argument to be had okay so I expect anybody reading in the future readings as well uh, and visitors I hope you listen to this and, and there'll be no more uh, arguments or discussions or debates over the biblical origins and uh, involvements of the original idea and concepts of Freemasonry. And so next, the question, the next question following is, as we continue on, why those equalities amongst Freemasons? And the answer to that is, we are all equal by our creation, by much more so by the strength of our obligation. Okay. And so this clause, which I consider most important, uh, to Freemasonry has been entirely suppressed in the last revision of the lectures. To show its value, I may briefly remark that it enumerates the requisites which constitute the character of a Mason, records the historical fact which conferred on the order of the, honor, the honorable title of free and accepted. It illustrates the universal bond of brotherhood and specifies the principal links in the Masonic chain, including all the grades of rank by which civil society is cemented and held together. Thus, evincing that the true nature of Masonic equality does not arise merely from creation as the children of common parent, but more particularly from the strength of the Masonic obligation. The cause also includes another historical fact of great importance to demonstrate and explain why it was considered necessary that a candidate for Masonry should be able to declare that he is the son of a free woman 
a privilege to wit, as masons, as subjects of a state whose institutions are free and beneficent, we may refer with honest pride and perfect satisfaction. The fourth clause in the question starts, From what particular part of the world do you come? The answer, From the Holy Lodge of the St. John of Jerusalem. What recommendation have you brought whence? A recommendation from the worshipful masters, officers, and brethren of that uh, Holy Lodge who greet you thrice heartily. In a formula used A.D. 1720, we find the passage thus expressed, R.W. and the M., the fellows of the H.L. of St. John, from whence I come, greet you, greet you, greet you thrice welcome brothers. End quote. And any other recommendation? Hearty good wishes. Since you brought no other recommendation, what came you here to do? And the answer, not my own will and pleasure, but to learn and rule and govern my passions, to be obedient to the Master's will, to keep a tongue of good report, to practice secrecy, and to make further progress in the study of Freemasonry. Now this clause has been introduced to illustrate the subordination necessary to ensure the observance of strict discipline in the Lodge. During the progress of Freemasonry since the revival in 1717, it has undergone many alterations. In the examination of Sir Christopher Wren, it was thus expressed. And the question begins, What Lodge are you of? And the Lodge of St. John, symbolized by the Triangle and Cross. How does it stand, perfect east and west, as all churches and chapels do? How many angles in St. John's Lodge? Four, bordering on squares, each containing 90 degrees. The ritual of Desuglers and Anderson exhibits this variety. And from whence come you? From the Holy Lodge of St. John. What recommendation brought you from thence? And the recommendation which I brought from R.W. and W. The brothers and uh, worshipful brothers uh, and fellows uh, of the Holy Lodge of St. John from whence I came was to greet you thrice heartily well. What do you come here to do? Not to do my proper will, but to subdue my passion still, and the rules of masonry in hand to take, and daily progress therein to make. Are you a mason? I am, so taken and accepted to be amongst the brothers and fellows. In the United States it is given thus. Brother, from whence come you, as an EAP mason? From a holy lodge in the holy St. John's in Jerusalem. <clears throat> what came you here to do? To learn and subdue my passions and improve myself in masonry. You are a mason, then, I conclude? I am so taken and accepted among brothers and fellows. How do you know you are a mason? By being often tried, never denied, and ready and willing to be tried again. At the present time, the passage is considerably abridged. What mode of introduction have you recommended yourself to notice of Mason? A salute of respect to the master in the chair. Any other recommendation? A hearty salute to all under his direction. What, what purpose came you hither? To regulate my conduct, correct my passions, and make a progress in Masonry. These variations embrace a common object of teaching courtesy and brotherly kindness, which could never be effected in if every member of the lodge were to do that only which is right in his own eyes. Confusion and disorder would undoubtedly follow such a practice, but he has something in view of a higher character than this which is indeed is the real secret of masonry. Even the improvement of his mind, the government of his passions, and the regulation of his discourse by a tongue of good report, and any word to make due progress in the philosophy and science of the order. And the fifth clause continues with the question, how do you know yourself to be a mason? By having been examined and approved, well reported of, and regularly initiated into the order. How will you convince me that you are a mason? By signs, tokens, and perfect points of interest. What are signs? All squares, angles, levels, and perpendiculars are good and sufficient signs to know masons by. What purpose do they serve? To distinguish mason in the light. What are tokens? Certain friendly and brotherly words and grips which distinguish a mason in the dark as well as the light. Will you give me the points of interest? Give me the first and I will give you the second. I, Haley, I conceal. What do you conceal? 
all secrets and mysteries belonging to Freemasons and Masonry except it to be true and lawful brother for his caution. But I, or as I am examiner, you may safely reveal to me the points of interest. Of that and on. Of that and on what? And on my own free will and accord at the door of the lodge and on the point of a sharp implement. When were you made a mason? When the sun was at its due meridian. How do you account for that, as masons are generally made in the evening? The earth being spherical, the sun is always at its due meridian in one part of the globe or another. Where were you made a mason? In a just and perfect lodge. What is a lodge? An assemblage of brethren well meant to expatiate on the mysteries of the craft with the book, square and compasses, the book of constitutions, and a warrant empowering them to act. When met and makes them just, the holy book. What makes a lodge perfect? The number seven. Under what denomination? One master, two wardens, two fellow Christs, and the rest may be as injured apprentices. What makes it irregular? It's the charter, the warrant, and the constitutions. Why so? The first is the acknowledgments of our meetness, meetingness, forms, and ceremonies by the laws of our country. The second is an ancient and legal authority of the Grand Master. And the third is the sanction of the Grand Lodge. By whom are you made a mason? By the worshipful master assisted by the wardens and brethren. This is a clause of landmarks and a very essential to be understood. Although it is differently given at this present time, I must, however, observe that the prepositions of, at, and on which Dr. Hemming has retained are improperly said to include the whole ceremony of initiation, which they certainly do not. I rather prefer a beautiful illustration which was used half a century ago and ought not have been omitted in the modern ritual, because it actually does include the whole ceremony of initiation. It ran thus. How many ori- and the question begins. How many original and perfect points have we in masonry? Twelve. Name them. Opening, preparing, reporting, entering, prayer, circumambulation, circumbul- advancing, obligation, entrusting, investing, situation, and closing. The twelve original perfect points in masonry in use in the ancient lectures were opening, Reuben, preparing, Simeon, Reporting, Levi. Entering, Judah. Prayer, Zebulon. Circumambulation, Issachar. Issachar. And advancing, Dan. Obligation, Gad. Entrusting, Asher. Uh, Investing, Napoli. Uh, Situation, Joseph, known as uh, Manasseh, or Ephraim. Or Ephraim. Uh... Not Ephraim, it's Ephraim. And closing, Benjamin. Why are they called original and perfect points? Because they constitute the basis of a whole system of masonry, and without which no one ever was or ever can be legally received into the order. Every person who is made a mason must go through all these twelve forms and ceremonies, not only in the first degree, but in all subsequent ones. The explanation of these twelve points of entrance, which formed the creed of our ancient brethren many years ago, is much more extensive and too long for introduction towards the close of a lecture. If I were duly authorized to revise the ritual, I should certainly restore much of the passage, although not perhaps in this introductory portion. I now proceed to the sixth and last clause of the first section of the Entered Apprentice uh, Lecture, and uh, I'll begin as the question has, have Masons any secrets? And they have many valuable ones, is the answer. Where do they keep them? In their hearts. To whom do they reveal them? To none but brothers and fellows, known to be such on due trial, proof, and examination, or in the body of a just and lawful lodge. How do they reveal them? By help of a key. Does that key hang or lie? It hangs and does not lie. Where does it hang? <clears throat> it hangs within an arch of bone. What does it hang by? The thread of life in the passage of entrance, nine inches or a span long. Why is it so nearly connected with the heart? 
a tongue being the index of mind, it ought to utter nothing but what the heart truly dictates. To solve this Masonic mystery, can you tell me what manner of metal this key is composed of? No metal at all. It is a tongue of good report, which ought always to speak as well of a brother in his absence as in his presence, and when that cannot be done with honor, justice, or propriety, that adopts the distinguishing virtue of a mason. What virtue is that? Silence or secrecy? Of all the arts which masons possess, silence or secrecy is that which particularly recommends them. Tactunity is a proof of wisdom and is allowed to be one of the utmost importance in the different transactions of life. The best writers have declared it to be an art of infinitesimal value. In that it is agreeable to the deity himself may be easily conceived from the glorious example which he gives in concealing from mankind the secrets of his providence. The wisest of men cannot pry into the arcana of heaven, nor can they divine today what tomorrow may bring forth. The ancient rituals exhibit some curious variations of this clause. In the examination of Sir Christopher Wren, the illustration ran thus. Question starts, have you the key to the lodge? Yes, I have. What is its virtue? To open and shut, and to shut and open. Where do you keep it? In an ivory box, between my tongue and my teeth, or within my heart, where all my secrets are kept. Have you a chain to the key? Yes, I have. How long is it? From my tongue to my heart. De Siglers made a slight alteration and exemplified it in this manner. What are the secrets of a mason? Signs, tokens, and many words. Where do you keep those secrets? Under my left breast. Have you any key to these secrets? Yes. Where do you keep it? In a bone box that neither opens nor shuts with ivory keys. But does it hang or does it lie? It hangs. What does it hang by? A toe line, nine inches or a span. What metal is it of? No matter of metal at all, but a tongue of good report is as good as behind his back as before his face. At the present day it is thus given as you all know. By what means is any further conversation held? By means of a key equally regular in its construction and its operation. Where is the key found? Within the arch of the bone. Where does it lie? It does not lie, it's suspended. Why so? That it might be always ready to perform its office and never to betray its trust through negligence. What is it suspended by? The thread of life. Why so nearly connected with the heart? To lock its secrets from the unworthy and to open its treasures to the deserving. Of what is this key composed? It is not composed of metal nor formed by any mortal art, explain this mystery. It is a tongue of good report, ever ready to protect, never to betray. What are its distinguishing characteristics? To defend the interests, interests of a brother in his absence, to speak favorably of him, if truth will permit, and when that cannot be done with propriety and to adopt the mason's peculiar virtue, silence. In other words, don't tell. Even if they are unfavorable. In the modern tracing board, this emblem, which constitutes an immovable landmark, is most unaccountably and improperly omitted. The key is one of the most important symbols of Freemasonry and ought to be prominently kept in view. To the uninitiated or imperfectly taught Mason, it bears the appearance of an inanimate metal instrument, whose use is obviously confined to the performance of one simple act, and is applied Masonically and as the insignia of the treasurer. But the well-instructed brother views it with a different eye. He beholds it in the member, uh, in its. Oh, he beholds in it the member. Sorry, which, according to its use and application, is the greatest blessing or the greatest curse to man. If improperly used, it is a fire, a world of iniquity, untamable and unruly evil, full of deadly poison. It defileth the whole body and is inspired. As an inspired apostle asserts, it setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell.
This mass of evil, the consideration of our Masonic key, is entrusted to correct, for it represents not a slanderous tongue, but a tongue of good report, which will always hang in a brother's defense, and never lie to his prejudice, or in other words, will speak as well of a brother in his absence as in his presence, because when present, he is able to defend himself, and if, unfortunately that cannot be done with propriety, to adopt the distinguishing virtue of the silence. For where candor cannot be commended, the silence will at least avoid reproach. And this section of the EAP lecture contains a beautiful display of the purest morality. What indeed can be more estimable, <laughs> estimable than the spirit of brotherly love which is here inculcated? Can anything have a more direct tendency to promote the glory of God, peace on earth, and goodwill towards men? This is the use and end of the golden rule of Freemasonry. Consider that abstractly in the moral which it teaches. It instructs you as brethren to dwell together in unity. It teaches you to imitate the innocence of the lamb, the peacefulness of the dove, and to let the head, the tongue, and the heart be united as they ought to promote each other's welfare and to rejoice in each other's prosperity. It admonishes you to be candid to a brother's fault and never to condemn until you are thoroughly convinced of his unworthiness and even then to adopt the golden rule always speak well of a brother if you speak of him at all but if you cannot do so with strict justice say nothing this while it gives him opportunity to repent and retrieve his reputation will contribute to your own peace of mind and you will thus avoid those dissensions and disputes which are never credible creditable and often dangerous and this is an anathema to, uh, and this is me speaking now, not the author. This is an anathema to what they they talk about innocence and honesty and integrity, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're keeping secrets, if you're hiding your brother's faults, even to the fact of, like we see nowadays, to the degree of pedophilia, to murder, to, to, uh, uh, industrial espionage to just to all the things that are taking place because other brothers will not speak out against a brother it is you you're that is not godly that is not holy that is not righteous and and that is the problem that has infiltrated and ruined uh, Freemasonry in uh, the long run is secrecy because the Lord is not a man uh, uh, the creator, the master architect of the universe is not a uh, being of secrecy. He's really not. Um, and I'm not going to continue on that, but that, that's the point here. There's a there's an athema here. There's an oxymoron. It's a, a contradiction in, his, in their own philosophies. And thus I conclude... All right, I'll continue with this lecture here. Thus I conclude my lecture, his lecture. It, if it has afforded you any information or instruction, I shall feel myself amply pre repaid for my exertions. Variations in the ritual. Um, and it, it goes on. Uh, in the year 1720, questions and answers occur. Question, where does the uh, Master Mason stand in the West? Where does uh, the... Uh, FC stand in the south. Why so? To heal and conceal. Give instruction and welcome strange brothers. Where does the EAP stand in the north? Why so? To heal and conceal. To receive instruction and to strengthen the lodge. What is the form of the lodge? An oblong square. Why so? The manner of our in the manner of our great master Hiram's grave. Okay, and that's Hiram Abiff, of course. And uh, with that, I conclude the 23rd reading and I thank you for joining me I hope that you glean the point of me reading this particular piece and uh, at this particular time and these particular points um, and you can see the grave difference of modern Freemasonry what is lost what is gained what was always there to begin with um, and the inherent problem with the secrecy and organization of Freemasonry and why it has been infiltrated and corrupted and changed. And with that, God bless.